Yeah, thanks, Gabby, and welcome, everybody. I'm really glad to be talking to you today about something that I really enjoy doing and feel really passionate about, which is cold calling. Uh, and it's such a uh, it, it's such a seemingly simple thing, right? But I really like to geek out on it and kind of peel back the layers of what goes into making cold calling great. So I'm really welcome the opportunity to kind of share my experience with you guys today. So uh, what is Prosperworks? Prosperworks is a CRM that teams love to use. We are trying to solve for the adoption crisis in the CRM space by uh, automating tasks that eliminate manual data entry, uh, providing uh, a sales process that can be executed and adhered to by the sales reps, and then reporting and insights on that process so that you can revamp your go-to-market efforts and improve them over time. Uh, that's you know what most CRMs claim to do. However, we uh, are, are able to, I think, do that uh, better because we integrate with the G Suite so the teams really love to use the CRM and so you can trust the data going in um, and rely on the uh, insights that are coming out to refine your business. So let's talk about cold calling, guys. So uh, I'm going to start with the, the question of, is cold calling dead? You know, and this is something that I've heard said for seven years now. Um, I think you can probably guess where I fall on this side of the argument, but I think it is important to address this because many of you might be thinking about this in the context of should this be something, should this be a motion or a muscle that I build in my go-to-market strategy and in my sales organization. So I'm going to start here. I clearly think cold calling is not dead, and I'll give you two reasons uh, why I think that. The first is, is why it's good for the company and the second is why it's good for you as a sales rep to embrace. So first of all, a majority of high growth companies say it's very much alive. Um, Discover Org did a survey on this and uh, the majority of companies that are high growth that had over 40% year over year growth for a three year period employed and managed a rigorous cold calling motion. Um, so there, there certainly is a, a track record of success even in the modern day sales environment of companies uh, using cold calling to great effect. Um, the second thing on, on why it's good for the company or why you should probably do it, um, and this kind of relates to in comparison to email marketing. Uh, we use email marketing all the time um, through you know, targeted ultra specific campaigns to uh, you know, webinar posts and, and a sales blog, you know, to email sequences to new trials to sign up. So we very much embrace this. However, what you're gonna notice is that in a cold call, you, you have a chance to be dynamic. And what I mean by that is there's going to be inflection points when someone either receives your cold call or reads your email where they decide, I'm interested or I'm not. I'm going to look for more information or I'm not. I'm going to completely delete this email or hang up on this person or I'm not. And in an email, it's, it's just out there, right? And so you really don't have a chance to kind of influence someone's behavior one way or the other once it's out in the open, right? And a sales call, you as a salesperson have a chance to respond and think on your feet and address concerns, no's, issues, roadblocks that might come up in the sales process and basically generate interest where there otherwise wouldn't be any in a way that you might not have the opportunity in a different medium for communication. And, and I think that is unique to personal interaction. Um, and that's why I think cold calling is so valuable or one of the reasons. Um, and then the second reason is uh, the last reason on good for company is uh, I'll go back to the slide um, is that you know you don't have to pay uh, uh, you can't pay marketing on commissions and what I mean by that is you know sales reps that are generating revenue or business interests or leads through cold calls generally get the bulk of their pay on commissions so you only have to pay them it's, if it's effective um, marketing is you guys no, you have to pay up front. I'm not, I'm not aware yet of any, um, you know, uh, kind of marketing campaigns that allow you to only pay them if, if you get business out of them um, or get people to actually convert, right? So you're, you're making a decision between upfront costs that may or may not result in business or only paying on the certainty that you have won the business. And so, you know, from an expense side, it can be very cost effective and, and strategic for a company to add cold calling as part of their marketing spend or their go-to-market kind of expense portfolio. So I think that's that's the case for why you should, as a company, consider adopting cold calling. Why is it good for you as a sales rep? Because cold calling is hard, and we're going to talk about how to be good at it in this webinar, but it is a challenging thing. And the most challenging thing is overcoming the fear of getting into it in the first place. 
um, and the fear of rejection or whatever else is going to go with that and coming up with a plan. So if you can be great at cold calling, I, I, I'll, I remember once when I was, when I first thought I was getting the hang of this, right, and I was able to generate some business, um, had a good quarter when I was early in my sales career and had sourced a lot of business myself. And you, you, you have this realization, this moment, or at least I did, and I hope you guys will have this too, where you realize like, man, I don't need anything else, right? Like we don't need expensive marketing, although it's great to have. You know, we don't need, uh, I don't know, like a warm intro or a referral, although those are also great. But if you can cultivate the skill set for yourself of being able to say, you know what, just give me a phone and the phone book, and I will be able to go out and create revenue for this organization, I'm telling you that is an employable skill set that you will have for the rest of your life. And that is like, like I remember having that realization when I could do that. I was like, man, I'm gonna be able to have a job in sales forever, right? If you can be good at the cold call, I'm telling you as a guy who's hired a lot of salespeople, I'll hire you. You know, like you you will have a career in sales that you can, you can pretty much bank on. Um, and you can take great pride in having mastered something that a lot of people are afraid to do and and that is a very very valuable thing so should we be doing cold calling is cold calling dead not at all cold calling is alive and well so let's talk about how to do it effectively okay so the first thing we're going to talk about is winning with preparation and I think this is literally as important maybe more important even than your pitch or what you're going to say in your cold calls or in your voicemails or what have you. And so there's a few things that you need to do before you launch a cold calling campaign personally or as a sales manager in your organization. And the first is to define the objective of the campaign. And I'll give you a hint, it's, well it's gonna be different for every single business, but the, the, I'll give you a hint that it's not gonna be to sell. You know, you're not gonna realistically expect anybody to purchase your product or services straight off of a cold call, right? You, you will most often be trying to get them to evaluate your product or service, which means setting a demonstration. That's the most common reason in my career to cold call somebody. But there are other reasons. Maybe you're trying to get somebody to attend your trade show booth, right? Or your uh, VIP prospect event uh, on the evening of, of the trade show that people are going to be attending. Um, maybe it's to drive more visits to a webinar like this one. Maybe it is to sit down for a demo. And, uh, and, and formally evaluate the product or service. But the point is you wanna know like what is the objective? Like we're gonna take this group of people, we're gonna call them and we want them to do something, some call to action. How many people actually did that call to action? You're gonna to wanna to measure that, so clearly you need to know what that is going into it and set your realistic expectations that it is a, a step on the ladder towards purchase, but it is not purchase in and of, in and of itself, okay? So the second thing, is building a proper list. Um, and the key to that is focus. Um, Jeffrey Moore wrote a great book uh, a while back that has stood the test of time called Crossing the Chasm. And he talks about how to pick uh, your first target that you're gonna go after with your efforts. Um, and he calls this the beachhead strategy, which is take a narrow uh, strip of land, if you will, and go at it with overwhelming force so that you can dominate. So when you guys are thinking about who are you going to go after with your cold calling campaign, you know, you might have many different industries or use cases or buyer personas that could benefit from your product or service. I would suggest first narrowing it down to the one where you guys have the best product or service market fit, uh, where basically you have a good uh, I don't know, um, average contract value or annual contract value where you have a somewhat limited competitive landscape um, where there are no legal or regulatory barriers and where you can just go in and absolutely dominate, right? And so that might be based on industry, but I would even go further and go to like industry or within a certain segment of an industry with uh, and then geographically concise, right? So maybe that might be, you know, in our business, it might be, I don't know, uh, consultants in digital media in San Francisco, right? So that when I am calling them, they're going to be receptive to the same general pitch. So I can get really good at my one value proposition I'm talking about my cold call, where if I were to name drop a well-known local customer, 
they would know them, um, and and that would be relevant. And then as I start to create inroads into this beachhead and generate new business, that I'll start to be getting relevant word of mouth referrals, where I'll be able to build a name brand presence in a way that I wouldn't if I were to shotgun my cold calling efforts across the entire country or the entire globe or multiple industries. Um, so be very, very specific about who you are going to after, who you're going to go after, and then aim to absolutely dominate that segment. And once you've reached that dominance, then you can move into adjacent geographies. Like maybe that means going from San Francisco to Northern California, or San Francisco to LA, and then LA to the Pacific Coast, and then the Western region, and then moving across the country from there. Once you kind of like, you know, have have built that momentum, um, and then. Uh, Secondly, uh, not moving on until you have really established that strong foothold, right? So um, that's the key to, to how you pick your target. When it comes to building the list, uh, you guys can ask us some questions at the end, but I can tell you there's a lot of different ways to go about doing that. Um, one thing that I've used in the past that works really well is um, uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, where you can uh, get kind of like titles um, and, and names of people. Like you can develop a list of companies you may want to go after and then people within that company who are going to be your right buyer persona or decision maker. Um, another thing that works well is a group called Task Us, which can kind of like outsource list building and qualification, um, and that works fairly well as well. We're talking about uh, the mental preparation, and I think the point there is just being ready for the person who answers the phone, uh, or being ready to, to go after whoever you're contacting to actually answer the phone. Um, and then secondly, you know, cold calling is going to be hard, right? I think you're going to not connect most of the time. You're going to get people who blow you off or hang up on you or tell you never to call again or whatever. So you got to be, you know, you got to be nails. You know, what I mean, you got to go into this uh, having absolute faith in your value proposition, in what you're talking about, and in your self confidence that you can do this. Right? It sounds cheesy, but like I said at the beginning, you know, if you can be really good and resilient at this, then you are going to cultivate. Uh, an eminently employable skill set that is going to be very valuable to you guys uh, for the rest of your careers. So embrace whatever happens on a call with academic curiosity. And you know, there's a million things you can do. Whether it's you know, I, I highly recommend uh, you know, kind of getting up in time and then spending a little bit of time either on your commute or before you get on the phone uh, to um, you know, to to do a little intentionality around cultivating. Uh, a positive mindset, right? I've got a guy on my team who listens to box cello suite uh, before he gets on every demo, that to the 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 two minute and twelve second intro at the beginning. Um, some people do different things. Some people listen to music. Some people listen to uh, Tim Ferriss podcast, right? Whatever gets you guys going, uh, definitely do that so that you you're good on and you're ready to go. So let's talk about the structure of the call. All right, so. When you guys get on the call, I think the number one thing you need to think about is like the that you have a good rule of thumb is you have five seconds to earn five minutes, and then you've got five minutes to earn an hour. And so those are kind of the hurdles, right? So what that tells me is that when I get on the phone with somebody, I do make one of those connects. I need to say something interesting, relevant, and compelling within the first five to ten seconds to grab their attention. And then I've got about a few more minutes where I can discuss the solutions that we solve, maybe reference some other customers that uh, they might know of, um, and then make the ask for the call to action to book a next appointment, right? So the first thing I like to say is like, you know, hey, this is a Kyle from Prosworks, and then ask a quick question. That can be different. Uh, it's going to be different for everybody depending on who you're calling, what you do, or why you're calling. I can give you a recent an example of what we've done recently. Um, we have we have kind of an inbound based business, and so we had a lot of um, a lot of trials that uh, signed up with us say two years ago, but uh, never saw a demo or never uh, became a customer. So after two years, those are basically cold calls. You know, all we know is that we have a name and email address form, and that you know at one point. Um, at one point, they were interested in a. Uh, at one point, they were interested in um, in CRM, right? Um, so, uh, so it's pretty pretty much a cold call. Um, we called them with something like, "Hey, this is Kyle. I'm calling from Prosworks. 
I, uh, I'm calling about uh, a trial you signed up with us about two years ago. Does that ring a bell at all? You know, and just like really quickly get some engagement. So you get some back and forth. I know I, whenever I get cold called and I listen to, uh, you know, uh, to, to a random cold call, if they just like start talking at me for a period of time, um, then it, it's like it, they just completely lose me. You know, I'm like, oh man, how long is this going to go? Um, and, uh, and how long, like before I, I basically, uh, hang up or tell them I'm not interested. Okay. All right. So when you actually are doing the, uh, and I think we just got back around on the presentation. So sorry about the technical difficulties, guys. Well, uh, we're going to keep rolling through it, though. And thanks for bearing with us. Okay. So when you, you, you call, you try to say something, you know, introduce yourself, ask a question, get some engagement. Um, the next thing you want to talk about, and this is key, and it's going to be different for every business, but you want to talk about the solutions that you guys solve and not the, uh, uh, the, the what you do, right? Um, for example, like when we're doing a cold call, we don't talk about like, hey, we're calling, we're the CRM for Google, um, or we try to avoid it as best we can because I don't think people necessarily care about that, or they don't care yet because they don't know what that means to them, right? A more effective cold call might be like, hey, this is Kyle from Prosperworks. You know, do you remember doing business with us? No, yes, whatever. Okay, well, the purpose of my call is because our customers have a big problem with getting uh, the most selling time possible out of each month. Um, and we've been able to work with people like IDO and Raspberry Pi, and we're adding on average two selling days a month with the time that we're saving through our software. So if you guys are, you know, have you guys, you know, missed your quote any time over the last year or something like that, ask another question. But the point is I'm not saying even that we're a CRM or that we're the CRM for Google. I'm talking about the problems that we solve, which is, is time wasted, right? And then what you would do back at that time in order to hit your goals. Um, so that's different for every single business. Um, I know I work, I remember working, uh, a few years ago with a startup in, um, in Belgrade actually, and they were, uh, they had an idea to kind of encourage, um, medical tourism. I guess there's a lot of great doctors in Belgrade, uh, for, uh, for dentistry, for cosmetic dentistry. And it's, it's relatively low price. And so they were talking about like how, how to build a business around that. And their inclinations around discovery uh, was uh, it was like, hey, you know, did you guys know that there's great doctors in Belgrade? Like, did you know that you can vacation here and that it'll be really inexpensive? But we thought about like, what is it? What are you really solving for? You're not solving for, you know, inexpensive dentistry. That's more like the how. What you guys are solving for is uh, is self confidence, right? Or or like, so the the better question is like, you know, have you ever been uh, self-conscious about smiling at in a wedding photo, you know, or these kind of like very impactful moments in their life where you maybe you felt self-conscious and, and didn't want to show up your smile, right? Like that's what you're really fixing, you know, and the how of, you know, going to Belgrade and having a vacation and getting this dentistry done at a good price is less relevant than the problems that you really solve. So really think about that. A few big time do nots. Do not get on the phone and ask how they are, right? Hey, this is Kyle Prosperworks. How are you doing today, right? Um, I'm already bored of myself and you guys, like I said, have five seconds to earn five minutes. And so, uh, you just wasted for them asking a, a kind of throwaway question that you don't really care about. So don't do that. Don't ask if someone has time, right? You know, that is, uh, uh kind of violates the alternative choice law of closing, which is don't ask a question where one of the answers will end the call. <laughs> so they say no, and then it's over and then you kind of wasted it, right? Um, and do not lead with what you do, right? Like I said, lead with the solutions that you solve, not necessarily what you do. Okay, so we're going to talk uh, uh, next about crafting your tone and pitch. Um, the key thing here is that 86% of communication over the phone is tone. Words only account for 14%. So to me, this kind of settles the debate around whether you should script or not or invest a lot of time in scripting. Um, I don't think it's worth it. I think you're better off investing that time in cultivating how you were going to present yourself and getting in the right headspace to do that and then, you know, being able to think on your feet when you're actually on the call. So rapid engagement is the key, and you're going to want to use a purposefully unsalesy tone. Um, I, I had someone else come up with this analogy. This isn't mine, but I thought it was relevant. They said, you know, call like act like you're calling a bookstore to see if they have a, uh, a book that you want uh, in stock, right? So 
Um, you want to be kind of like really curious, personally interested. You got to geek out on their business, you know. So when they talk about what's going on, you need to be really, really interested and non-judgmental, right? So everybody hates, myself included, being or talking to the aggressive, demanding, and needing salesperson. They need you to take this meeting because their boss is, is all over them for not having enough opportunity, or they need you to take this meeting because they're trying to hit their goals or their quotas, and they're going to just like bulldoze you into it. I mean, if I'm honest, like you can bulldoze people into meetings sometimes just by being aggressive, and what will happen is they'll say they'll meet with you, and then they'll never show up or take your call again. So you want to be assertive, which sounds like, you know, so are you guys experiencing any of these problems? Yes, you are. Okay, then, then we should really talk. I'm thinking tomorrow at 2 o'clock or, or 4 o'clock would probably be the best times. So either of those work for you. Um, and that's the difference between assertive and aggressive, right? You want to be curious and then you want to be helpful. Um, so, you know, think about like, like do a role play uh, and, and think about that. And I've also, uh, I have some reps on our team that I've worked in the past that put a little mirror on their monitor uh, that they look into while they're making a cold call. And the idea is like sit up straight smile and engage and be like, look, if this is face to face, would you want to talk to me? <laughs> like what I want to talk to this person that I see in the mirror. And, and I always say when I see people kind of like leaning back in their chairs with their feet up, uh, making cold calls, like you just do not look like you are in any kind of position or mindset uh, to do quality work or do some business right now. Um, so be very mindful about that as well. Okay. And then I think we'll talk about one more thing, and it's just clearing the roadblocks, which you guys are going to get all the time. Like I said, about 5%, 10% of your cold calls are going to end successfully. So what do you do the rest of the time? And that means you're either going to get blow-offs and objections, like send me some info or I can't talk right now, or you're going to be leaving voicemails. So there's, there's a lot of literature out there and suggestions around how to go about each of these things. I think the thing that I've found to be most effective is uh, is in line with like you know like brutal honesty or, or radical candor um, and basically just being completely transparent with what you're doing and what how you perceive the situation when you're dealing with any of these things. So I'll give you some examples. So you you kind of say you know you do your thing uh, in a cold call and they say send me some more info. I, I would, I think we all know how that goes, right? You're going to send the info, the person's not going to read it. Uh, you're going to follow up in two or three days and say, actually, you know, I haven't had a chance to review your info yet. Follow up with me later and, and, and you're going to be, you know, you're, you're in the friend zone, right? So, um, so don't do that, right? If someone says, send me some info, I would say exactly that, um, which is, you know, um, I can absolutely send you some info. Uh, the thing is, whenever I do that, I usually call in two or three days and the person hasn't read it because this is more like a polite way of saying no than you're really interested in learning more about the software. So if that's what it is, that's completely fine. You know, you can just say that and no problems at all. But if you are having these problems, we really should just talk about them for 15 or 20 minutes and that will be the fastest way for us to determine if this is going to work out or not. You know, I don't need to send info that you, need to, that, that you then need to ignore. Right, and so that kind of really is incisive and kind of cuts to the bone. I don't think it's it's rude or overly aggressive. I think it's just honest, and I think that's the best way to handle these types of situations. Same thing with like I can't talk right now. Um, we had a, uh, a we had a rep recently. We, we were working on this where people would say, oh, you, like they'll answer the phone and say hello, and then we'll we'll kind of say who we are. And they go, oh, I'm in a meeting right now. I don't know many people that answer numbers when they're in a meeting. Uh, especially numbers that they don't recognize, right? And so I, I, I generally don't believe that to be true. So what I would say to that is, it, you know, okay, uh, yeah, that's what I usually say too when I accidentally answer a sales guy's call. Like, listen, I don't want to waste your time. It's only going to take 90 seconds. Um, and then kind of cut to the chase that way. Same thing with, our, or another, like, I can't talk right now. It's like, you know what? I'm also very busy. I don't have a lot of time as well. This will only take a couple minutes and go right into what your, what your, uh, your cold call plan is. Um, the, uh, the thing I don't want to hear, you don't want to say is, okay, no problem. When's a better time to call you back? They'll give you a time, they'll call back, and they won't answer. And that's what happens every single time. And then the last one is leaving voicemails. So you guys heard me say earlier that 40% of the, or 80% of the time, you're going to be leaving a voicemail. Um, so you definitely should have a plan for that. Um, there is some debate as to whether you should leave voicemails or not. And some people, they say, you know, oh, I don't want to leave a voicemail because I don't want to pester them. But they do want to try to call them again. Well, guess what? Everybody has caller ID. 
And so they're going to be just as irritated by seeing your number fall, pop up on their caller ID all the time uh, without any voicemail or understanding like what you are, what you're, what you're doing for, or, or what you're trying to get out of this conversation. Um, and then also like, you know, when you leave a voicemail, you have a chance to at least get your company's name in there, right? So maybe they completely ignore you, but then they see your, uh, your, your, your banner ad on Google and then they see your, you know, taxi topper and then they see their billboard and then they hear your friend talk about it. And all of a sudden it's like, man, I'm seeing them everywhere. Right? So it's just another reference point in the number of touches necessary for somebody to hear of a company before they make a purchase decision. So I say always leave a voicemail. If you don't think it's appropriate to leave a voicemail, it's probably not appropriate to call. Um, so how do you leave a good voicemail? A few things. One of them, uh, the, the number one is, is being vague, like less is more when you're leaving a voicemail. So I would say this is Kyle from Prosperworks. I'm calling about the sales organization. Uh, I just needed, I need, and, and then say, here's my number. 415, blah, 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 right? Like literally less is more. Be vague. Um, uh, the optimal length, they say, in terms of voicemails that are responded is 8 to 14 seconds. So that should guide about how much information you should be giving up in a voicemail. So that is kind of like, you know, I'm not the first person to say that. You know, there are other blogs out there that have talked about that when it comes to a voicemail. But I was thinking last night around, like, what are some pretty creative things that you could do in a voicemail? along the lines of being uh, very candid and honest. So if I know these statistics, which you guys now know because we've talked about them, I think it would be a lot of fun and actually really effective to be really honest with a voicemail. So what that might sound like is, hey, this is Kyle from Prosworks. Uh, I have no reasonable expectation that you're going to return this call, but I'm hoping that when you see us at uh, the Google Next event or see our tax stoppers around or when you're looking for a CRM that you'll think of us. Again, this is Kyle from Prosperworks. And then, like, don't even leave a number or something, right? Like, just have some fun with it. Or you could say, hey, this is Kyle from Prosperworks. Uh, we're the CRM for Google. I know 95% of voicemails are not returned. However, 5% are. I can't wait to find out which one you're going to be. And then just say your number and hang up, right? Um, so that kind of stuff is represents to me like a pattern interrupt where you can't just leave, I mean, you, like, why not, right? Like, just have fun. You cannot leave the same generic voicemail that everybody else leaves that every junior SDR has left in the history of phones. So you got to say something that kind of catches people's attention with a pattern interrupt by being a little bit creative. So I'd be self-referential, a little self-deprecating, never hurt anybody, um, and generally just have some fun with it. So that's how I go about voicemails. Okay, guys, so uh, in the end, we're going to go with a few key takeaways here. Uh, in terms of winning with cold calls, you know, we've talked about a lot of stuff here today. Um, well, if I can think about, like, what are some of the, the, the three most important things as you guys decide as a company to go in and doing this or not is, one, once you decide to do it, you got to commit to it, right? This is going to be a process of iteration and getting better over time, and it's going to take volume in order to start seeing results that really matter and move the needle. So you can't dip your toe into cold calling because you're just not getting enough volume for you to decide whether it's going to be successful or not. And you're not going to learn anything, right? So once you commit, you got to go big, right? Second thing is the, the idea of the beachhead strategy. The right target is as important at the, as the right pitch. So do your legwork up front to make sure you're going after the right people so you give yourself the best chance to be successful. And then lastly, have some fun with it. You know, like it's going to be a slog. Um, and, and you develop this kind of like, uh, you know, brother in arms mentality, right? Where the people around you that are going through this with you, it, it, it can be, it can be brutal, but the winds are great. And then those moments when, um, like when somebody says, you know, no, I'm not interested or, you know, they, they say something to kind of blow you off or say no. And you say something back that is relevant and contextual and to the point, And they say, you know, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. I'll see what you guys have to offer. Right. That to me is what sales is, right? Like, like anything else than that, you're just farming. And so when you have a chance to change someone's mind uh, and turn a no into a maybe or a maybe into a yes, you know, that is the most fun part of the entire profession, in my opinion. So you guys have lots of opportunities to do that when you're cold calling. Um, so that's it, guys. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties in here. I hope you guys got some value out of this. And we have a little time left, so I'd love to take some questions from y'all. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Apologies again for the technical difficulties. I want to thank all of you for staying on the line. Um, but we have gotten some good questions. So 
Ravi is wondering, what are your recommendations to overcome the fear of cold calling? Ah, yeah. So uh, cold calling is a program of action, which means that you got to know that it is going to work eventually. And I think the key is to once you've made the decision to do it, to not revisit it. Right? Um, and it's kind of like, like, I don't know if you guys have ever like jumped off like a, a high dive or a, uh, a cliff or something. I grew up in, in rural Massachusetts, so we grew up doing that. We used to have a rule that was like, once you get to the ledge, you got three seconds to jump or you shouldn't at all, right? Like the longer you stand up there, the harder it gets. So once you get to the ledge, just jump, and that, that's what makes it the easiest, right? So I, I, I don't think there is, uh, the, there, there's no magic bullet besides just doing it. It's kind of like punching a clock, right? There's no shortcut. You just got to show up every day and put the hours in, and the fear will melt away after, after a few hundred of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dolan's wondering, what is your recommendation on how to get through to the gatekeeper? Yeah, gatekeepers, great. So, um, so gatekeepers are literally there to make sure that you can't talk to the person that you want to talk to, right? So the key there is to think about how your product or service actually improves the gatekeeper's life. And when you're relevant, this is actually, I, I would break the rule that I gave you earlier um, about asking, you know, not, not how are you um, or, uh, um, uh, or anything like that, but you gotta say like, hey, I need you to help me out. Like, you know, like, hey Jim, this is Kyle of Prosperworks. Um, I really need your help. I'm trying to get a hold of this person. What is the absolute best way to do that? You know, and so you, you cannot bulldoze the gatekeeper, like they will sniff that out and you cannot BS the gatekeeper, they'll sniff that out. Again, I have yet to find any better strategy in sales than complete and total honesty. And so you might even say, it's like, look, I really need your help. I'm trying to get a hold of this person. I don't wanna waste anybody's time and I can respect the fact that, you know, part of your job is making sure that I don't talk to this person. So I wanna make you look bad, I wanna make you look good, here's what we do, so what is the best way for me to get a hold of Because I'm gonna keep trying no matter what. So can you help me out, you know, and something along those lines. Cool. And that's wondering if she should always send an email with a call. I wouldn't say always, I think it doesn't hurt, right? Um, I, one thing that I would do though is try to be careful about referencing failed previous attempts at contact. So you never wanna like when you're leaving a voicemail like, Hey, uh, following up on the voicemail I left you yesterday, you know, or I just sent you an email. I don't know if you got it right, or sending you an email. I just left you a voicemail. So it, I would do them concurrently, but not necessarily referencing each other, right? So yes, do send an email uh, that talks about what you do. And and you know, we we did a webinar uh, last month on on cold emailing. Um, that had a lot of these kind of like same motifs of, you know, uh, talk about solutions, reference customers that people will know, um, and don't necessarily talk about like what you do, but more the solution that you solve and so forth. Uh, but yeah, send emails uh, and cold call, but I wouldn't reference my calls uh, or my, my emails in each other and vice versa, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, D is wondering, are there better days in the week to make calls? Um, there's a lot of research out there that says that there is. Um, I, I, I find that to be like varying tremendously from industry to industry. Um, so they, some people say that like Tuesdays and Thursdays are the best days to make cold calls. The worst times are early Monday morning because people are really busy kind of digging out of whatever happened over the weekend or late Friday afternoon because people are kind of checked out. Um, and that, to me, passes the sniff test of, of making reasonable sense. Um, but beyond that, I wouldn't overthink it too much. Um, I know that, you know, I, for, for part of my career, I was calling to dentists. And that was tricky because you know, they do have, you know, front office employees um, and admins. So you almost always get somebody on the phone. However, they are very much the gatekeepers. And so you had to figure out kind of the best time. So, like, we were calling dentists on the East Coast from San Francisco, and we figured out that they're usually open for lunch from 12 to 1 because that's when everyone else takes their lunch, and it's a popular time to have a dentistry appointment, and then they take their lunches from 1 to 2, uh, and kind of staggering it with the crowd. So we figured out that from 10 to 11 West Coast time was a good time to call dentists on the East Coast because they were likely on their lunch break, 
I'd also try to call like right after business closed because usually the receptionists are still there. However, the doctor is no longer seeing patients. So again, that was very specific to the work we were doing at the time. Um, but as you guys, you know, what I definitely would do is look at like connects by um, by time of call, right? Um, and so if you guys have a good CRM, you'll be able to do this pretty easily. But you can look at like, you know, when am I making these calls? What's my connect rate by hour? And and if you do that over a large enough sample set, you can probably back into what the best times are for your business or at least test your hunches. Great. Um, Jason's wondering how many calls would you say is reasonable to make within an hour? Yeah, so I think, uh, I've, so I've actually timed this like a, a lot, right? So if you are, are, if you make a call and leave a voicemail, it takes 45 seconds about for the phone to ring however many times it's going to ring and then leave your voicemail is about 45 seconds. And so the, the key to, 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 to rapid cold calling is your transitions. So going from one call to the next. So like how long does it take you from when one call ends to like quickly, you know, do what you need to do to update your CRM and then, you know, find your next prospect and move into it, right? So you want to be organized. I, I actually think like if you're doing nothing but prospecting that you can make, you know, 15 to 20 calls an hour. Um, and that's if you're, if you're really efficient with it. Um, I think, it, and I think it's reasonable to expect, right? Um, it depends also on like how specialized your team are. Like we have a, a, a team here of, of sales development reps whose only job is to cold call um, on, on our new trials and, and, and to our outbound customers. And they make about 80 to 100 calls a day. Um, and that's, that's pretty good, right? Um, I've been in roles too where you know I, I was carrying a quota and was doing sales demonstrations and still was expected to make 60 calls a day as well. Um, so I think that that's reasonable. I mean, I, it, it, again, it speaks to just how organized and efficient you are. What you want to look at is like you, you don't want to do a lot of research before every call. You know, you don't want to be screwing around looking at everyone's website before you make a call. You know, do that ahead of time. Get your list prepared ahead of time. And, 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 you know, practice economy of movement when it comes to updating your CRM and ending one call and getting the next. And you should be able to do 15 to 20 an hour. Devin's wondering, do you have any other keywords to use and or to avoid on calls? Um, gosh, I, I know what you're asking, yeah, but I, I can't think of any right now, right? Um, I, I, I would avoid actually all keywords, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? I think, I think the most effective calls, like I said, if you're, if you're going to aim to be unsalesy, then you don't want to say salesy things like, we help customize, optimize for growth, right? Like, or, or like, like optimize or scale and stuff like that, right? Like, I mean, those are, are thrown around so much as to be almost useless, you know, even though there is value in those concepts. So find a way to say it that's just plain spoken and to the point, and it's going to be more authentic and real, and you'll, you'll have better conversations. Again, think about that pattern interrupt, right? Don't sound like every other salesperson out there. So, you know, think about what they say. Uh, read the emails that you guys get uh, from solicited cold calls. Like, take a cold call. Next time someone cold calls you guys, hear them out. You know what I mean? And decide whether it was good or not. Like, evaluate it for its games and shit, and see if, like, you would take that meeting, you know? Um, even if your default behavior is just hanging up, which, you know, admittedly we all do. So, I, I, are there keywords to avoid? Yeah, all of them. And then, uh, Devin has another good question. What should some small companies use to gauge keep key KPIs, especially if they do not have a system that controls these, connects versus volume versus quality, like what are these um, KPIs they should be measuring? Yeah, so, uh, I, I mean, it's, I, I think there's, well, I guess there's two questions there, right, which is like, what are the KPIs that should be tracking and kind of how do we do that? So, on the first one, um, you know, what are the KPIs that should be tracking? I, I think before, if you guys do not have the level of sophistication yet, which, you know, we didn't at a certain point in our organization, every company kind of goes through these iterations and, and pains, right? Do not over-engineer it out, out the gate, right? So I wouldn't even worry necessarily about KPIs initially. The thing that will get you to win if you have nothing else or no other ability to track is just volume, right? Just commit to doing it and doing it a lot, right? And if you're gonna be driving the team on certain things, drive them on volume. And that, that's how we grew our organization, right? We knew that 
if we were on the phone a lot, we talked to a lot of customers, uh, and we rewarded success, then we were going to win, you know, and so that's how it started. And then we started doing that, and then we got more sophisticated, and we started looking at uh, connect rate, right? So of all the people who are dialing, uh, how many people are actually getting through to the, to, to the people they want to talk to? And we realized that the people who, who were doing that, we just asked them what they were doing. And they said, well, you know, we call Australia or we call England in the morning and Australia in the evening. We save the West Coast for after lunch. We call the East Coast in the morning. So they were just being really, really intentional about sorting their lists and calling based on when they thought the best time was going to be generally. And so then we made that the thing, right? And then we looked at, you know, conversions on connects. And, uh, and said, okay, so if you're talking to a lot of people, but they're not, you know, scheduling the demo or taking the call to action, then it must be the quality of your conversation or your efficacy on the call. And so that's a training issue, right? And then you would, we would prescribe role playing and practice and, and call recording and things like that, right? So, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to gum out the gate. You have to have all these things in place necessarily before you get a start. You know, you'll kind of learn better by doing and so I would recommend just starting by focusing on activity um, and, and celebrating wins, and then you can kind of become more sophisticated later. Um, as for tools, uh, you know, we can certainly help you guys out with some of that stuff, um, and there are others out there as well, but, you know, let us know what we can do. Going off of that, um, Lyle asked earlier, how much is CrossBoards for one user? Oh, uh, sure. Well, so it depends what you're going to use it for. Our average, usually our, our individual users pay about $49 a month for sports. Um, and yeah, I mean, with the, with the time that we save, uh, they usually consider it a pretty good value, yeah. but glad you're interested. Um, Nathan has an interesting question and also a potential webinar topic. Um, mm. He says, a lot of today was focused on phone calls. Any advice on in-person cold calling versus phone? In smaller markets, some reps spend time pounding the pavement, and there's an argument that face-to-face -face creates an environment that is harder to see. Harder to say no. Harder yeah, say yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, so uh, no, great point, right? And uh, and I've done, I've done a lot of that as well. Um, you know, when I was selling to these dentists, we had uh, geographic territories, and I would uh, co-travel with our distributors, and that would mean visiting 20 dentists a day, and basically just you know walking in with some some literature, right, and uh, um, and trying to trying to generate some interest. So uh, cold call. So so you're talking about like in-person generating interest. Um, I think <clears throat> the way to do that is to actually be consistent, right? Um, I found that. You know, the first time you walk in there, uh, you know, the, the receptionist kind of looks you up and down and, and, and diagnoses sales guy, and the shield goes up, right? And so your first ask is not like, hey, can I talk to the dentist or can I talk to the decision maker or whatever? It's like you literally just uh, uh, leave, like, like leave some information, right? And then come back in two weeks. And then come back in two weeks again. And this is how the distributors, the guys that like Henry Schein and Patterson were able to get in with these businesses in the first time, right? And then eventually you're going to observe something in the business that plays to your strength. And so they will get sick of seeing you and they say, you know, why do you guys keep coming back around here? And you say, because I really think I can help. For example, you just had somebody call and cancel a dental appointment and you just had to make 15 calls onto your short call list in order to, uh, to try to fill that appointment. I'm trying to talk to you about a software that will have that happen manually so you can pay more attention to people that are in this waiting room than having to make 15 cold calls to fill up appointments. Now, wouldn't that be a better use of your time? Because that's what I'm proposing. And so eventually, you know, through persistence, you'll have an opportunity to make your pitch. But, um, but I, it, it is hard, right? You know, face, I, I, don't think it, I don't think I would necessarily agree. Maybe I was, I was worse then. I, I know I was, actually, so maybe I just wasn't good at it at the time. But I, I had more success uh, in face-to-face -face settings, like face-to-face -face cold introductions, um, by being persistent rather than you know being persuasive necessarily the first time.
Hey guys, you can you hear us? All right, we should be back. Yep, should be back. Do you have any more questions, Gabs? We have a couple more. So Adam's wondering, he says a typical telemarketer is known to be loud, confident, and salesy. How do you differ from other salesmen without sounding boring and ineffective? Yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, sorry about that. So, uh, that's one way, but the, uh, how do you sound different? I, I think this is the, the part that I was talking about in tone. Again, it, it's like being a pattern interrupt. So, when I say don't sound salesy, that doesn't mean sound like muted, uh, or, uh, uh or, I don't know, disengaged or, or pulseless, right? Um, I think, you know, sounding kind of curious, a little self-deprecating, because those, like, those loud, confident, like, uh, you know, kind of bullish salespeople, like, those are from, like, the movies. <laughs> you know, like, that's, that's, we all saw Boiler Room and Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, right? And so, you know, I, I hear a lot of people when they're new to their sales career, like, they're accepted to me, their impersonation of a salesperson rather than being genuine and connecting with you, right? So um, when, if you are being treated like that, like a, like a kind of brash, salesy person that can just be easily blown off, you need to very quickly just cut to the chase and be very incisive with what you say and, and, and present as an alternative choice. So if people are like, like, look, man, I don't have time for this. It's like, look, you know, I don't have time either. Here's the deal, man. You know, we work with companies that are trying to, to grow and hit numbers. And the thing they struggle with is resource planning. And they are telling their sales reps to update the CRM, uh, and they're telling them to sell. And those are two conflicting instructions that every sales organization that we talk to struggles with. We're able to solve that with our CRM. So if you guys are having that problem, if you're having salespeople bitch about uploading the CRM uh, or staying late, or if you're trying to run reports and you can't trust what you're seeing because the data's not accurate, then you should talk to us because those are the things we solve. Now, if you don't have those problems, then that's fine. Then we should shouldn't talk but you tell me are you guys experiencing that you know I just really kind of cut to it right because like most salespeople don't sound like that um, and so that's what that's how I would approach that is is be be incisive don't be comp don't be like you know unjustifiably confident if that makes sense so we have time for one or two more questions um, Rebecca's wondering if you have any advice for a first video call I just had one and it felt like a cold call because I didn't have a chance to before to talk about our solutions. And this person was acting like he didn't know anything about the information I already sent, and also that he had a limited amount of time. Uh, sure, so yeah, this, this is, happens all the time, right? Um, I, I guess it's great that they showed up for the meeting in that case, obviously. Uh, but generally, I don't think people do read the information that I send, and I kind of go into calls like that, like assuming that we're, we're starting from the beginning. So that'd be the first thing is is don't assume that even if someone asks for information or even if you have like email tracking and you know they clicked on a link or read this email, like don't expect that information to be like retained and completely understood. So go in imagining that you're going to be need to do a little bit of discovery around kind of where they're at with their understanding. Um, and then for video calls particularly, um, you know, I don't have a ton of experience doing video calls where they can see us in a selling situation. Um, most of our calls are over the phone or with screen shares. However, uh, I was sold to by somebody over a video conference and, uh, and then they did this like kind of endearing self-deprecating thing where when they started it, they weren't visible, like they weren't showing their, their camera right away. And so they had a little bit of chit chat. They said, okay, we're going to go live. I'm going to go ahead and, and turn my camera on. So this, this can be a little bit jarring. So Hopefully, I don't scare you off, and then they, you know, turn their camera on. They're, of course, just like a normal-looking human being, right? But just having some fun with it a little bit, I think, is is the best thing you can do. And then this uh, question was sent in via email before the webinar. Um, what are some of your favorite opening lines? Um, so, all right. My, I mean, these aren't going to work for everybody, but my favorite ones are the funnest ones. And, and usually the ones, like I said, that kind of, like, make fun of yourself to – to kind of give everyone some media. So, like, I can think of, like, at trade shows, for example, you know, I remember standing in a trade show booth, and uh, and we'd see, you know, two people walk by, and you'd look at their their um, their uh, lanyards, and one of them is clearly, like, the CEO, 
And so you'd go to the CEO and be like, hey, you're the CEO, and then address the other person and be like, so you must be the person who does all the work. Can we talk for a second? And and that that's, that always went over really well because like they're both kind of mouth agape, like, geez, because everybody's trying to yell at the CEO, like, oh, hey, let me pitch you this, let me pitch you that. But to address that you realize he's the CEO, but then talk to to, to the guy next to him, that that's always pretty funny. Um, or uh, and gets attention. Um, but generally, just saying, you know, I can't think of any particular one that I really really like beyond that. Um, but you know, just anything besides, how are you? Do you have a second? Stuff like that. Just be, and, and the more incisive or the more self-deprecating, probably the better. All right, guys, so we're coming up on 10 o'clock here on the Pacific Coast. Um, I just want to go over a few things before we shut things down. Um, so there will be a recording of this presentation sent out uh, without technical difficulties. Um, you can expect that in the next day or so. And we also have a 12 p.m. broadcast if you guys are able to attend that, if there's anything you missed. Um, and if you have any additional questions, please send them to info at crossworks.com. And I'd like to thank Kyle for for helping me out today and <laughs> answering your guys' questions. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the presentation. Yeah, thanks to quarterback and everything, Gabrielle, yeah. and thank you guys all for attending. It was a pleasure talking to you all today. Yeah, thanks everyone. Have a great day.